the, the thousands. We're, we're, we're live. <laughs> you want to start? Sure. Why don't we talk about sort of where the book came from and all those things. So. Um, we are talking about Weird Women Volume 2. Obviously, this is a sequel to Volume 1, which came out last year. Um, and we, while you should buy Volume 1, you don't have to right. enjoy this book. These are all collections of short stories um, by remarkable women who we think deserve way more recognition than they've had. Um, the idea was really less is. We had done an earlier book called Ghost Stories together, and we had so much fun doing that. And, and I think you said, hey, let's, we want to do a weird women thing I'm well, all there was, over that. There was, a, there was a very direct inspiration. I was uh, at the Lilly Library at uh, Indiana University. Uh, giving a talk on Frankenstein. And the curator, a friend of mine named Rebecca Bauman, did a wonderful exhibit of things relating to Frankenstein. And one of the display cases was called Weird Women. And she had in it books, not short stories, but actual books by women authors who had grown up reading Frankenstein and, and were inspired by it and became writers themselves. And so I looked at it and I wrote down some of the names and uh, took pictures and then and it inspired the idea. So that's that's where this came from. So we owe Rebecca Bauman the title. We, we <laughs> Yay, thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so we, we started digging and it was not hard to find these stories um, because there were so many of them and they're amazing stories and I love putting them in these books and making sure that people find out more about these women. Um, and why don't we just go ahead, I'll read like the first part of this, you can finish it off. Sure. We're just going to read a little of the introduction. Well, we're going to read the whole thing because it's very short. Um, all right. Ask any woman who writes fiction meant to shock or disturb about response to her work, and she will no doubt offer up at least one anecdote involving something like, you wrote that? But you look so nice. It's certainly commonplace among modern female horror writers, and it seems likely that their sisters in the past occasionally endured similar responses. It's hard to say exactly what readers imagine a female horror writer looks like. Women have been writing this sort of fiction more than even the most avid of readers may realize, and for just as long, perhaps longer, than their male counterparts. Why aren't they as well known today as their male contemporaries? Why did so many feel compelled to write under gender-neutral names or as Mrs. X? Some of them did achieve literary recognition. This book, for example, contains work by Edith Wharton, Harriet Beecher Stowe, George Eliot, and Zora Neale Hurston, writers certainly as highly regarded as any of their male peers. However, none of them are thought of primarily as writers of supernatural fiction, nor were their reputations enhanced by their horror credits. Those whose stories tended to center on more arcane themes, women like Mrs. Oliphant, Vernon Lee, or arguably, given that she wrote in a number of genres, but her best work was horror, Mary Elizabeth Bratton, are now less studied and anthologized than, say, Ambrose Bierce or M.R. James. Rhoda Broughton was a popular author during her lifetime whose sharp tongue was said to have intimidated Oscar Wilde, but she's now far less known than her uncle, Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. Why should that be? It seems too easy to simply cite sexism, although there's certainly more than a grain of truth in that as well. Perhaps they didn't fit readers' preconceived notions of what they should be. Or maybe there's something subtler at work. Did they write about subjects or themes that were different from what men were writing about? Some did. Many of these women were deeply involved in social movements of their time. They were suffragettes, suffragettes anti-vivisectionists, and labor advocates, and their work often involves contemporary issues that may seem unimportant to modern writers. 19th century tales of matrons fretting over parenthood or wrangling with their nursemaids or wives living in terror of being widowed may be harder for a reader in the 21st century to relate to then say concerns about the appropriate bounds of science at the end of the world, themes that fascinated Mary Shelley, among others. Like many writers of the 19th century, these authors refused to be pigeonholed, confined to a genre, genres themselves probably being a 20th century invention. Instead, they wrote stories about things that moved them, 
be the stories romantic or scary or mystifying. Today we may look back and say Mary Elizabeth Braddon wrote crime fiction or Louisa May, Al May Alcott wrote young adult fiction. To a one, they would have rejected such classification. They wrote stories. And for many of these women, they wrote because it was their only possible livelihood, their only means to support a dependent family. A good story doesn't have an expiration date. It's a snapshot of history. And if it's an accurate depiction, it reveals our past and reminds us of those elements that have endured into the present. Rhoda Broughton's The Man with the Nose, for example, that's the name of the story, uh, may at first seem to be, to put it mildly, old-fashioned. But with its plot uh, revolving around a helpless wife, and mesmerism, but it also captures the terror of being stalked by a stranger, a form of dread shared by people across the centuries. May Sinclair's Where Their Fire Is Not Quenched and Edith Wharton's The Fullness of Life both capture the disappointment that many still experience when their relationships don't live up to their expectations. Zora Neale Hurston's Spunk shows a woman both wowed and cowed by a powerful man whose dangerously toxic masculinity will be instantly recognizable to readers from any age. And who doesn't feel some of the anguish of the mothers at the hearts of Josephine Dascom Bacon's The Children, or Mrs. S. C. Hall's The Drowned Fisherman? Religion is brought into play in several of these stories, proving almost invariably ineffective against greater forces. For example, in Vernon Lee's Marcius in Flanders, Florence Marriott's Little White Souls, and Alice Brown's The Tryst, ancient mythology seems more powerful than modern Christianity. If the 19th century was rushing forward at dizzying speeds that left many of those living through it consumed by existential fear and anxiety, surely our modern world isn't immune to those concerns. Not all of these stories are about subjects that are traditionally female. Some, like Mary Chalmondelli's terrifying Let Loose, exist simply to entertain the reader with a roller coaster ride that leaves us turning the pages ever faster. Others, like Harriet Beecher Stowe's The Ghost in the Mill or Gertrude Atherton's The Dead and the Countess, offer gentler, more playful takes on folklore. Their charm is impossible to ignore even a century and a half later. It must also be admitted that parts of these stories may be difficult for modern readers to swallow. The narrators of the tale may be casually cruel to servants. People of different races or faiths, colonialism, or including people of, of different races or faiths, colonialism might rear its ugly head. And of course, misogyny is on open display. A failure to be reflective of 21st century attitudes, however, should not be caused to consign a story to obscurity. If we are to change how we treat others, if we are to progress, we must look unblinkingly at our past and acknowledge our mistakes and wrong-headed attitudes. A gifted writer is one who can show us who we were, no matter how much we may deplore our own behavior. This anthology is not intended to serve as a memorial to forgotten women writers or to somehow apologize to them for their marginalization. It's not meant to be a history lesson about the birth and growth of supernatural fiction. Instead, it's meant to present to a modern audience important works by important writers, works that have been left too long in the shadows with timeless insights into human nature and our basic fears. In a world where the voices of women continue to be ignored, we hope that readers will rejoice in rediscovering these echoes from the past two centuries with messages that are as critical today as when penned. I think I mean, a couple of things I, I, I really like that we said in the introduction. And one of my favorite themes, and Lisa and I have talked about this often in, in choosing the stories that we choose, is that we're not trying to whitewash anything. We're not censoring. Uh, we're not looking for politically correct stories. Um, I feel very strongly that it's important to look, as I said in the introduction, unblinkingly 
at our own past and recognize that maybe the attitudes we held then were wrong, but you can't just ignore them. You can't erase them. Uh, that's who we were, and we should be learning from that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, th that, I think, is a, especially seen in the Florence Marriott story we chose, um, which is a, all about British colonialism. It's set in India during the Raj, um, and the, that's one of the prime examples, I think, of what we mentioned in the introduction, the casual cruelty towards serving people and so forth is reflected in that story. But the story is still very powerful in many respects. It's, it's a terrifying story. It's about a woman whose um, child is, is ill and the doctor tells her to take the child back to Great Britain and she doesn't want to do that because of what's going on with her husband. So she goes up into the hills of India alone with just a small retinue of people. And she's also pregnant. So it, it works into these, these sort of, I think, timeless fears as well as shining this light on this ugly aspect of colonialism at the time. Um, it's, it's really been interesting in doing these stories and uh, uh, our, our other collection that we mentioned called Ghost Stories, that in looking at those stories, um, it takes very little effort to transform them into a contemporary story. Uh, to, to, if, you, if you were gonna present that, for example, as a television episode or, or a radio, whatever, radio, like podcast, whatever, um, and, and wanted to contemporize it, you wouldn't change very much because the kernel of the stories isn't locked into uh, a particular century. We probably should give you a little background, by the way, on who we are and sort of why we did this. Both of us are fundamentally, Lisa, Lisa is all mixed up. Lisa writes fiction <laughs> and nonfiction. I uh, don't have the talent for fiction, so I just write footnotes mostly. But both of us are really intensely interested in the history of the horror genre um, and, and the important, uh, our, our important predecessors. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I've done, you, you did books on, uh, you did one called Ghosts of History? Ghosts of Haunted History. This is, history, this is yeah. promotion time. Yes. So. <laughs> and uh, the last nonfiction book was Calling the Spirits a History of Seances, which was really fun because the spiritualism aspect of that crosses over so much into so many of these stories. And I did the annotated Frankenstein and the annotated Dracula. Uh, and. I should also mention that Lisa and I came up with the idea for a series called uh, The Haunted Library of Horror Classics, which is being published by the Horror Writers Association, of which Lisa was the president. Uh, and uh, that is more of this, except that they're novels, technically, or short story collections. Uh, we are publishing there, uh, we're up to eight, I think? I think so, eight yeah. titles. Uh, not the Great big ones. I mean, you won't see Frankenstein or Dracula in this series because they're already out there. There's lots of editions. But we did The Beetle um, by uh, 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 Richard uh, Marsh. Uh, we did Vatek. Uh, these are stories that people aren't exactly, they're not exactly on the tip of everyone's tongue. Phantom of the Opera, but the book, not the musical. Uh, <laughs> Um, let me think if I can think of them all. We did uh, House on the Borderlands by William Hope Hodgson. A collection of Arthur Conan Doyle horror stories. Called uh, The Parasite, Parasite mm -hmm. and Tales of Terror, Other Tales of Terror. Um, Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by yes. Emma James. Chris the King in Yellow. Yellow, Robert Chambers. Um, the, one, the next one out is The Mummy. Um, is that eight? Did of I do one eight? Blood. Oh, Of One Blood, very important book. Uh, by uh, Paula Pauline Pauline Hopkins, Hopkins yeah. who was uh, the first editor of Colored American Magazine and, and really the first important writer, a black, a black writer of fiction uh, in America. Uh, and she also wrote Hagar's Daughter, which is a sort of mystery. It's one of the very first mystery novels. Huh? But um, she wrote this wonderful book about sort of a lost world uh, called Of One Blood. Uh, so those have been great fun, and and those are, I don't know if the store has any of those, they're trade paperbacks, um, but they are, they're terrific, and uh, they're terrific not because we wrote them, but because we 
came up with the titles, we edited them. They're very lightly annotated, uh, mostly sort of vocabulary. But they're, the, they're books that you want to know if you're interested in supernatural fiction, if you're interested in, in this genre. Um, and so we're both intensely interested in the history of the genre and have done lots of work in it. Um, and we're working right now on another book called uh, Haunted Tales, which is sort of the Ghost Stories 2, yes. I guess. Is That's how <laughs> we, it started. <laughs> we thought there was a better title than Ghost Stories 2. We owe Peter's job for letting us use the title Ghost Stories, but oh well. Um, so, we don't want to read more, uh, but we'd love to talk. So, your comments, your questions, your criticisms, why didn't we include your favorite story? <laughs> Well, I think it's so rare to have two experts sitting here, so I had a question about the genesis of this genre. I was always taught it was the Castle of Otranto. And oh, we forgot that one. Yeah, it's in the series, right. by yes. the way. Castle of Otranto and the English Baron. Um, we put it out, called them Gothic Classics, and that's another book in the Haunted well, I was curious to know, it sounds like that one resonates with you, but yeah. if you have a personal kind of seminal book... I do, yeah, aside from that one. Um, an 1848 book called The Night Side of Nature. 1848? Uh-huh. Wow. Um, and this was a book, which is something that we almost included a little piece of in one of these. Right, and I just thought of another one. Um, we're probably to us, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. The Night Side of Nature is really interesting because it spawned the, it was a major influence on the spiritualism movement that, that erupted in both the UK and the US, and it also is the book that sort of codified ghost stories. Um, and it um, is a really nonfiction, which is why I wasn't sure we should include something from it in one of the... Catherine Crow? Yeah, Catherine Crow. Who also wrote Mysteries, by the way. Okay, yes, and a, a few other odds and ends here and there. Um, and had a strange personal life, we'll talk about that sometime. <laughs> she, um, she collected folklore from all over Britain and she put it into this book and it was released originally as two volumes, it was so gigantic. And it's such an interesting book, it's, it's still fun to read. I mean, it's just an endless collection of and such and such saw a specter in the graveyard on May 1st and that said his name. And I mean, it's just, it's, some of the stories are crazy and they're all very disturbing. And it's, it's a really interesting book to read um, and just humongously impactful. Another early book that we should mention very early, I forgot the date, you'll know that you know, is Phantasmagoriana, mm -hmm. uh, which we are hoping will be the next volume in the Haunted Library series. Uh, if that title sounds familiar to you, it was the book, I guess we'd say it's the book that inspired Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein. Uh, the famous story that, that everybody's heard is how Mary Shelley and, and her then uh, Let's see, were they married? No. Her then boyfriend, Percy, uh, and uh, her sister, and John Polidori, and Lord Byron were spending a summer evening. Uh, it was a thunderstorm, and uh, so they decided to read ghost stories to each other. And the ghost stories that they were reading was the book called Phantasmagoria, which was a collection of German um, they're not all, are they all ghost stories? I'm not sure, maybe. Uh, that had been translated into English um, right around then. Actually, it was in French, I think. They were reading the French edition. There's some, there's a little bit of uncertainty as to which one they were reading. They might have, there's also an English translation called Tales of the Dead. And so it's entirely possible that they had brought Tales of the Dead with them over from England. Um, but there might also have been a copy of the French version. Sitting in the via. So, the, 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 you know, so horror fiction as such, I mean, yes, Castle of Toronto is important. Um, it's the first really successful gothic novel. Um, but there's other stuff. I mean, The Blazing World, I'm not sure I'd call that horror. It sort of is. It's just. Yeah, right. Uh, Blazing World is older. Mm -hmm. um, 1600s. Uh, but there's, you know, some of this is just the product of collecting folklore, um, because that's where a lot of these stories came from. Uh, Fantasmal Goriana doesn't quite feel like it's sort of invented stories. It feels like these are stories that people yeah. told, 
that somebody like the Brothers Grimm did, you know, wrote down. And um, so that that's where a lot of this stuff came from. And, and I'm sure there's other collections that we've lost and just never seen yet that are out there because it's immensely popular. You know, supernatural goes back to the Bible, earlier than the Bible. You talk about stories about ghosts and spirits, certainly spirits. Uh, but I mean, there's you know, the Witch of Endor conjuring a ghost in, in the Bible and so on. So this is really old stuff. Uh, and we've always, as human beings, been fascinated in, about death. What is it? What does it do to us? What happens after death? Does something happen after death? And and uh, uh, and blood. There's another subject that fascinates humans and has always fascinated humans because it's this secret substance. It's only inside. You know, it leaks out occasionally, but it's it's inside your body and you can't find it lying around on the ground. Uh, does it have magical properties, mystical properties, etc.? So vampires, blood drinking. These all go back to the Greeks um, and, and legends before, and the Egyptians before that, when you, or the Phoenicians even, if you talk about legends and, and uh, stories about this stuff. So, you know, we're, we're kind of late to the game here. 2,000 <laughs> years later, we're, we're starting to tell some of the same stories. But the interesting thing is, of course, that as literature developed, people saw the stories were about more than just being scared. They were about the human condition. Uh, and you could use these stories to explore things that had very little to do with the supernatural. That's what the great writers found, I think. Mm -hmm. I Please. You mentioned how some of these collections have probably been lost to time. I'm a little interested in what your research process was like for this. I'm a librarian, so I'm like, which archives did you hit up? Like, what was the best thing that you found, like held with your hands during this process? There was there was one um, story that we included in volume one by a writer named Regina Miriam Block, and and this was an interesting situation where she kept coming up in critical studies we were reading, and we couldn't find her books anywhere, and and it turned out that she has never been reprinted. Um, she wrote two collections that were released in, I think, 1918 and 1919. Um, they're sort of um, a mix of plays and fables and horror stories. Um, and the only place nearby that I could find her books was the University of Riverside Special Eaton Collection actually had both of them. So I did indeed make an appointment and drove out there one day um, yeah. and got to, to see them both and we used a piece from one of those in the first volume. And so that was really fun to, to hold those. And I, they were, they were Which very is nice. one of the best titles of any of the stories. Yeah. The, the, the Swine Gods, yes. yes. <laughs> and, um, which is also the title of one of the collections. And I, I photographed all of both books while I was there. And I actually really would love to transcribe those and put them up at like Gutenberg.org or something so everyone could, could read them. Because there are some other really interesting stories in those books. Um, and she is now a forgotten writer, which is really sad. So um, that was fun. That was a, an exciting thing. And, for the new book that we're working on, I stumbled across something that I just absolutely was really excited about and, and loved. I was digging through, I decided to just see, because a lot of these stories were printed as Christmas stories. Because in the 19th century, that was how you celebrated Christmas. You got together and you read ghost stories to each other. And Charles Dickens would put out a special issue of his magazines every Christmas. He would do a Christmas annual that would be full of ghost stories. And so I thought, oh, I bet there's some really good stuff that's buried in those that nobody knows about. And I started digging a little bit, and I found a letter from Dickens from 1855 in which he was writing to a friend. And he said, I have just found the best ghost story ever written. And I'm like, wait, what, what? And it turns out that he published this story two weeks later in his magazine, Household Words. The story under his publication was called A Ghost Story. It's by a woman named Dinah Mulock. Um, 
She published it in her own collection two years later under the title M. Anastasius, and it is an awesome story. Um, it's going to be in the one that we're working on right now. You have to wait. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Well, um, the one called Haunted Tales. Haunted Tales. Oh, okay. yeah. Which is, we allowed some men writers in that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, the, the, you, it's a good question because the, the process isn't um, totally explicable. I mean, first of all, we did try to stay away from stories that are frequently anthologized. Uh, uh, there, we, we made an exception for Haunted Tales, for example. We included uh, The Canterville Ghost by Oscar Wilde because it's just such a wonderful and it doesn't really, I don't think it gets enough attention. But, um, but um, it's, it's a process of looking everywhere. Critical books, other people's anthologies. Um, both of us love old and rare books. Uh, so getting your hands on those and sort of leafing through them and reading, 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 reading a ton of stuff. Uh, there's some good internet repositories. There's a, a there's a website called something like Horror Masters that's over. They're not doing any additions to it, but it must have a thousand stories on it, uh, indexed by author and a few of them, and some subject indexes. Uh, and so, you know, we'd say to ourselves, uh, "Gee, we really would. Lo I'd love to have a Lafcadi O'Hearn story in the book." Um, so, read a bunch and say which one hasn't been anthologized a lot. This is a great story. Let's use. Um, and so that, that's part of the fun, really, is the, de, de, I wouldn't even call it debate, the, <laughs> the discussions and the sharing back and forth. Have you read this? Have you read that? Uh, Lisa does most of the hunting, I will say, because she has nothing to do all day. She yeah. sits around in her used bookstore and well, reads I do, books. I have a little advantage working in a great used bookstore, because, I mean, we'll get something that's like, ooh, here's a 1930 anthology of ghost stories. I wonder what's in here. And I'll take it far and take it home and find little gems. So we try and cast the net really broadly. I mean, you know, we're never going to be able to be, oh, we have found an unpublished M.R. James or something. You know, I don't think that's ever going to happen. But... Um, we are, and we're not deliberately going for obscure. I mean, that's not the point here. Um, but we love including stories that have not been anthologized before, and especially writers um, that just have been overlooked. I mean, this this whole idea started um, with a series of books that I did called In the Shadow. Um, the first one was called In the Shadow of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you can guess what that was. Um, and the second one was called In the Shadow of Dracula. And what I aimed to do was to bring back into the light writers and, and stories that had gotten lost because these other characters were so famous. Sherlock Holmes you know, makes people say, oh, there couldn't have been, there weren't any other Victorian detectives. Wrong. There were lots of them. And some of them were pretty good. Vampires. Never was a vampire story before Dracula, right? Of course there were. Um, and that led to In the Shadow of Edgar Allan Poe, which was early horror fiction. And that led to In the Shadow of Agatha Christie, which was early uh, women crime writers. And that really sort of directly led to uh, this series, I think. The ghost stories was really came out from, that was my thought for, first about wanting to do stories that were themed about ghosts that had gotten lost, that, that had been overshadowed by that damn Peter Straub and, you know, <laughs> uh, and M.R. James and people like that, although we did include an M.R. James. Yeah, you have to. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little personal, but just move my mouth. So knowing what you guys know, which I feel like you guys are expert historians, basically, do you yourself believe in ghosts or spirits or monsters? <laughs> Have you had any experiences, or just like? I yeah, I, I this is the time of year when every other day I'm doing another interview with as a pair. I'm I'm now called a paranormal historian. I do. A, At least I forgot to mention she wrote the definitive history of Halloween. Really right. right. Um, so it's like tomorrow morning at eight, I get up and I do an NPR show. Um, so it's every day and. That's one of the questions I get asked most frequently, and I have 
I like to draw an interesting line on being a skeptic. I am a skeptic, um, but I am not a skeptic who says there's absolutely nothing happening, people are imagining this, blah, 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 because I have done a lot of paranormal investigating. Um, I have stood next to people who are sensitives or mediums, and I had absolutely no doubt that they earnestly were experiencing something while I was six inches away and experiencing nothing. Um, so my skepticism is that I don't believe that the spirits of the dead are returning, but I absolutely believe that people are experiencing, some people are experiencing something, I don't know what it is. Um, the one time I had an experience that I could not explain was in the Stanley Hotel, which is supposed to be one of the most haunted places in America. Um, it was in 2014, and I was doing an overnight investigation there, and it, we were in an outbuilding that's a concert hall. And it was October, and it was 3 in the morning, and it was very cold in there and very windy, and so there's like lots of old noises in this old building, and you've been hearing tales about the spirits that are supposedly in there. We were using something called a spirit box, and I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is a hot thing right now in paranormal investigating. It's a little box that's like a radio that scans radio frequencies at a tremendous speed and it makes a sort of wash of white noise. And every once in a while you'll hear a word blurt through and the idea is that spirits can use this energy and can form a word that comes through this, this mass of radiation coming into this thing or EMF or whatever. And most of the time it blurts out things that are clearly something that some radio host is talking about somewhere. Or occasionally it will say, it'll just be like, and somebody will say, no, it said stop, you know, and you're like, no, it went wrong. But here we were at three in the morning and this thing blurted out, it had been going on for like 20 minutes with nothing interesting and it suddenly blurted out a word that sounded exactly like mostelaria, which is, the original Latin name that translates to the haunted house that was a famous play by Plautus. And I had been studying this play for my book, Ghost of Haunted History. And it's one of those things where you're like, did anyone else hear that? Yeah, what was that word? Okay, that was really weird. How that could have come out of <laughs> Well, I would have Colorado. been impressed if this thing had said, Lisa Morton, are you there? Most Deloria. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly right. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a darn good argument for them not to exist, unfortunately. But that was a weird thing. I can't explain that, except that it, it was probably a case of what is called, I think, pareidolia, which is the human capacity to make things that are random into something that makes sense. Um, that's the way our brains are wired. It probably said something like, most of the area or something. You know? yeah. <laughs> but, so that was my one truly bizarre moment. I've never witnessed an apparition. I, I've never heard a convincing EVP. I don't know if you know what those are. That's the electronic voice phenomena. That's where people record like an empty room and then pump up the gain to hear if anything's in there. And I mean, most of the time I listen to those and it's like, it said, get out or you're going to die. And I'm like, no, I did not say that. I'm sorry. Um, I haven't had any uh, personal experiences either. Um, when I was touring with uh, my annotator Dracula, I was asked about, could I talk about my own vampire experiences? I said, well, I don't really have any. Uh, I said the uh, scariest thing I discovered when I was researching uh, Dracula was the uh, consensual vampire groups. Uh, there's a magazine called Bite Me, published in England. And it, it has ads for, here's where you can get your red contact lenses, and here's dentists that will work on your teeth. Oh, they're, they're called like Spanish Smiths. Yes, well, okay, well, thank you. So um, that was the scariest experience I had in doing the research. But um, I'm not prepared to write it off as impossible. I guess I, both of us have a deep interest in seances and spiritualism and magic, uh, conjuring. Kind of magic. I'm not talking about, you know, I'm going to make you float. I'm talking about stage magicians and the like. And um, so, I mean, I've read a tremendous amount about Houdini, as have you, and for example. Uh, so I'm, I'm skeptical, but I, I, Houdini wanted to believe. He wanted to find that he was wrong, but he went into it, as so many have, James Randi and many other investigators, 
knowing that there's a lot of con artists out there. Uh, and not all of it's evil or, or being done to make money. It's some of it's just because people believe and they want others to believe. And so there's a lot of fake things out there. And I've never seen anything that isn't. Now, when I was doing this last book, Calling the Spirit to History of Seances, I was halfway through the research on it, and I said, you know, this book really should just be subtitled The History of Fraud. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something else I get asked a lot when I'm being interviewed is, did you find any, any evidence that any of the mediums in the 19th century might have been real? I'm afraid not. <laughs> I mean, there were one or two famous occurrences that were not easily explained, but I am not convinced they were real either. So. But they were fueled by this tremendous desire oh, yes. to believe. Yeah. And so, you know, when you, I mean, spiritualism started really in the mid middle of the century, 1848, yeah, 1848 yeah. with the Fox sisters mm -hmm. and, and some of those folks. Um, but, uh, and, and it really reached its peak, I think, probably in, in the early years after World War I. Um, and if you think about it, it made perfect sense. I mean, here were families devastated by the loss of their young men, in most cases, young men, but in some cases, women, nurses, and so on. And they desperately wanted contact with those people, and so they bought into it. And you had prominent scientists, um, uh, et cetera, all saying, oh, spiritualism's real, you know, it's a... We can prove it. We don't ask you for to take this on faith. That was the spiritualist approach. We don't ask you to take this on faith. We're going to prove it to you. Yeah. Uh, so it's still around. <laughs> There's still plenty of people, I think, who go to ten seances and go to fortune tellers and all it's that. It's bigger than ever. And in fact, I am um, just did a CNN podcast called Margins of Error that launched last week and. Um, the, the theme of it was, why is the belief in paranormal rising? Um, and when they approached me about being on this, this show, they said, um, we want to know if you think that belief, in the, if you agree that belief in the paranormal has risen during the pandemic. And I said, I not only think that, I predicted it. Um, when we first went into lockdown in, in March of 2020, I, I said right off the bat, this is going to be a boom in paranormal belief because we see it every time in history when there's a massive traumatic event, when there's a gigantic war, when there's a, a terrible pandemic. Um, and so I was totally not surprised. And the, the pandemic created some extra interesting things too, like people were suddenly stuck in their house for months. And most of us don't spend that much time in our houses or our apartments normally. We're out of jobs, we're out of visiting friends, whatever. Suddenly you're stuck in your house for like months and you start going, this house has weird sounds. I never <laughs> noticed that that thing creaks. What is that? And, and that was part of it too. But also with the pandemic, you had the same thing that happened during the Civil War and World War One, which was um, you might have a loved one who died who you didn't you weren't able to watch die. You weren't able to be there to have that sense of closure with them. So um, it created, again, this tremendous need to have, to get comfort, to have a last communication with your loved one. It also, the, these same events that produced this, this um, rise in supernatural, which we call it, belief, uh, also give rise to supernatural literature. And, and I have this slightly crackpot theory about that that's, that's motivated a little differently, that that's basically people trying to deal with the horrible, terrible things that are going on around them, um, whether it's war or uh, just the death of, the in, of industrialization uh, or, uh, or, ep or epidemics or whatever, that when we write horror literature, we master that, you know. We, we get it under control. Um, we can uh, we can put in a happy ending, uh, <laughs> or at least we can give the reader the ability to say, you know what, I'm done with that story. 